Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inuzor Education. Um, we are continuing um, this advanced mathematics course for uh, teenagers presented on Unizor.com. Um, this lecture is a part of it and it's dedicated to theory of probabilities. In particular, I would like to um, address a couple of problems, very, very simple problems um, in the theory of probabilities. Um, I do suggest you to go to the website and try to solve these problems just yourself. Um, so this is uh, dedicated to certain very simple properties of random variables. Um, so this is problems number three for random variables. All right, so again, it's very, very simple. And um, what's important is that there are certain implications of uh, these very simple problems related to statistics and that's why I would like actually to really address it as a lecture although again it's so simple it doesn't really deserve to be a lecture anyway so the first problem is you have a random variable which takes uh, values x1 x2 etc xn with corresponding probabilities p1, p2, etc., pn. Let me just repeat that uh, for um, discrete random variables which take only certain finite number of values with certain probabilities, the probability basically means that if I make an experiment with this random variable and take its value, um, if I will conduct certain number of experiments, then the relative uh, number of results of x1 for the value of this, of this random variable will be approximately a fraction of p1 times the number of experiments. And as the number of experiments goes to infinity, the closer and closer this statistical frequency of occurring the value of x1 will be to uh, p1 and correspondingly with the same others. Uh, I'm just saying it, you know, just so you don't really forget what really the probability in this in this particular case is. Um, it's more of an intuitive understanding of probability. It's not a formal definition with measure theory and stuff like this. All right. So we have this random variable. Now it has its own um, expectation or a mean value, which is basically a weighted average of different values with uh, probabilities as weights. And I did prove that, again, using the statistical definition, the frequency-based definition of probabilities, indeed, the average value of the certain, uh, uh, of the certain experiments of the um, random variable uh, xi would actually be uh, closer and closer to this value uh, as the number of experiments goes to infinity. All right, now, my question is, what if I will consider instead of this random variable another random variable? A is a constant. Now, intuitively, it's obvious that if my random variable has certain average or mean value or expectation, then the random variable which is obtained from the same one by multiplying by constant with correspondingly values a times x1, a times x2, etc., a times xn, with the probabilities the same, because I'm not changing the nature of the variable, just um, multiplying by, by a constant. Intuitively it's obvious that the standard, uh, that, the, that the expectation of this variable should be equal to this. The same constant multiplied by uh, the expectation of original variable C. Intuitively it is obvious but let's just prove it very simply. Here it is. Since new variable eta takes these values with these probabilities, then according to a definition of the expectation, 
its weighted average of these values with weights are probabilities, right? Obviously, we can uh, uh, factor out the multiplier A and what will be in parentheses. This is exactly the expectation of the C. So, A times E odd C. Now, as you see, the the, the proof is absolutely trivial. However, it's always good to have it. Um, and uh, this is basically the property of expectation. I did prove before that, for instance, expectation of the sum of two random variables is the sum of their expectation. Well, now we know that we can multiply by a factor, by some constant, and again, expectation is really behaving exactly like a linear function. So basically, expectation is a linear function of random variable, which means that any linear combination of linear variables results in the corresponding linear combination of their expectation. Okay, so that's what number one. Number two problem is analogous. But we will now talk about, vari uh, about variance. So again, we have this variable C, which takes x1, etc., xn with probabilities p1, etc., pn. Now I am interested in variance of A times C. And um, my theorem is that this is A squared times variance of C. Now, Again, let's talk about intuitive kind of understanding of this. Now, variance is, as you remember, um, a, a, a weighted average of deviation, of squares of deviation from the mean value, from the expectation, right? So, this square actually makes this A square here. But let's just do it um, uh, mathematically. So, let, uh, let's have this... Um, symbolic um, uh, for expectation. So expectation is mu. And this is, as we know, x1 times p1 plus etc. plus xn times pn. But this is, doesn't really matter. Now, what matter is that the variance of c is equal to, again, weighted average of squares of deviations from the middle. From the mid, from the mean, so it's x1 minus mu squared times p1, x2 minus mu squared times p2, xn minus mu squared times pn. So that's what variance of the variable x is. Now, what about a times x? Well, we know that expectation of is a times mu, a times expectation of c. We just proved it a second ago, right? So, variance of a times c is equal to, again, it's squares of deviation. So, x1 minus, sorry, the variable a c takes values ax1, ax2, axn, etc., right? So it would be ax1 minus expectation, which is a mu square p1, plus ax2 minus a times mu p2, etc., plus axn minus a times mu square times pn. Now, obviously, you factor out a from every parenthesis, but since it's square, it would be a square times 
x1 minus mu square p1 plus etc plus xn minus mu square p n close square bracket and this is the variance right so that's exactly what we have just proven the variance of a times c is a square times the variance of the xi. Again, the proof is elementary. There is absolutely nothing uh, ingenious about this type of proof. But, however, I would like to um, like make a point that uh, the expectation and variance can be taken from a constant uh, multiplied by our random variable and that's how um, the expectation and variance of the new variable uh, is uh, expressed in terms of expectation and the variance of the old one. So expectation is multiplied by the same constant and variance is multiplied by this uh, s uh, constant square. Now, how about standard deviation? That's the third one, right? Well, this is simple. I'll just use the definition of the standard deviation as square root of the variance, right? Now, we know about the variance. Okay, now I will make a mistake. Since square root, this is a square and square root of variance this is standard deviation, right? wrong this is what's right because the square root of a square is not a it's absolute value of a because a can be negative right? Now, whenever we were, we were doing this variation, uh, variance, uh, multiplications, etc., it was always square. So that's, that's fine. It doesn't really matter whether it's positive or negative. Now we have to really worry about this. So this is the correct formula. So the standard deviation of A times uh, sigma, uh, xi, sorry, uh, standard deviation of A times xi is absolute value of A time standard deviation of xi. Okay? So I hope you are very careful. This is the correct. This is incorrect. Alright? Okay. So basically these are um, three properties of a constant multiplied by a random variable. It's expectation multiplied by the same constant. It's variance, but then it's multiplied by a square of the constant. And standard deviation, it's multiplied by an abs absolute value of this constant. Now, when I've done that, I would like to address the following. Now, what is this? This is basically something which all the people are doing when they are thinking about statistics. They are making, for instance, a measurement. Let's say you are measuring um, a table uh, with a ruler, right? Now, you measure it a few times, or different people with the same ruler and the same table are measuring a few times, and you might have slightly different results. You know, some millimeters here, millimeters there, that's actually an error of your measurement. It depends on the ruler, obviously, on how precisely these centimeters and millimeters and inches and quarters of an inch are, are, are actually marked, etc. So there are some errors. Now, what does it mean? It means that every measurement has i is the measurement number. It's basically some real value 
and there is some real value which is the length of the table, right? Let's call it you know, plus some kind of a error. And different, you know, measurements have different values of this error. So it can be, let's say, a, a real value for the uh, table length is, is one meter, right? So that's maybe one meter and one centimeter, or which is 101, or it can be 99 centimeters, or it can be 99 and a half centimeters, or a hundred and half centimeters, etc. right? So there is some kind of an error. Now, how can people eliminate the error, or at least reduce it? So what they do is, they measure it twice, thrice, they measure it a hundred times, and then they're averaging the results. They're thinking that if during one experiment they made one error, then another experiment will make another error, and then another error, and all the errors combined maybe will nullify each other, and on average we will get um, the correct uh, readings of the of the lengths, right? Um, by the way, I'm doing the same thing when I'm measuring my blood pressure. I, I, I know that these apparatuses are not really precise, so I'm measuring a few times on different um, arms, and uh, then I'm just averaging the results, and that's, I think, is more or less nullifying, not exactly nullifying, but reducing the error which is made during every particular measurement. Now, does it have sense? I mean, is it really right to do it this way? Do we really reduce the error? And here is what I would like to address right now. Let's just think about it. First of all, we are assuming that all these represent independent and identically distributed ra uh, random variables. So if these are measurements of the same table uh, with the same ruler uh, by the same person, then, well, it's a good assumption that we are uh, m more or less independently making measurements and, uh, and the result of the measurement itself might be really identically distributed. So it's a reasonable assumption, okay? All right, now. What can we say about the average? Well, the average of this thing is equal to um, the uh, expectation of their sum divided by n, right? We know that if there is a constant multiplied by something, then this constant is can be just taken outside of the expectation. And this expectation, the expectation of sum, I didn't prove it for n, I, did, I proved it for two um, uh, random variables, but obviously it can be expanded using the induction um, to a sum of any number. So it would be n times expectation of any one of those, because they are identically distributed, divided by n, which is mu. I assume that expectation of xi is mu and variance of xi is equal to sigma square. Let me just write it a little bit more accurately. Sigma square. And this is mu. Now you understand why this is square, because variance is a, a weighted average of squares of deviations from xi to mu. Okay, fine. So, first of all, that's what we have. That's good. Which means averaging n experiments, we are getting the uh, random variable which, is, which has exactly the same um, uh, expectation, the mean value, as the original one. So, we are not really deviating by averaging and different uh, identically distributed and independent random variables, um, we are not deviating from, from the mean value of each one of them. The result has exactly the same mean value, and that's to be expected. I mean, you're just averaging the same, um, uh, dis d d the same distribution, basically, you're averaging. Now, how about variance? Okay. Variance, first of all, you have this 
constant which you are supposed to take out from the variance as square, as you remember, right? Now, inside you will have variance of their sum. Now recall that I actually demanded the independence and identical distribution of all these variables. And if you remember one of the previous lecture, the variance of the sum of independent uh, random variables is equal to sum of their vari variances. So what I have right now is n times variance of C1, which is sigma squared divided by n. This is extremely important. You see what happens? The variance of the sum of n, the average of n uh, random variables, is n times smaller than the original uh, than the original variance, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So whenever, um, if variance is a good measurement measurement of um, of the error which we are uh, making by by measuring, actually standard deviation would be even a better. Um, so if you have a standard deviation of eta it would be sigma divided by square root of n right it will be square root of variance so the standard deviation is a good measurement um, of precision which you are measuring certain things right so if original precision was um, was having a standard deviation of uh, sigma which is again it's average deviation from the from the mean value then the sum has the standard deviation square root of n uh, uh, square root of n times smaller that's exactly why people are averaging together many different measurements of the same thing to get a more precise evaluation of the mean value because the mean value is basically the base from which you are deviating by making certain errors. So the errors combined together are nullifying each other and the error of this average of n different measurements is square root of n smaller than the error of each individual measurement. That's why people do twice and thrice and whatever number of times. Um, there is even old Russian proverb that you have to seven times measure and one time to cut. Uh, yes, if you want to cut it precisely, you have to really measure a few times and then, well, it's not said uh, in, in the proverb, but basically you have to really average the results of your measurement. You have to really um, make it more precise. And to make it more precise, you just make it a few times and average the results. The more times you are measuring the same thing and averaging the results, the more precise uh, would be the result, uh, it will be closer to the mean value which is, you know, supposed to be the real um, the real length of the table or whatever the measurement, uh, blood pressure or whatever other me me measurements you're making. So that was my very important point, that this averaging is reducing um, the standard deviation and the variance of, of the resulting random variable. And that's why whenever we are doing this, the result will be also a random variable with the same expectation, but with a much smaller deviation from this expectation. And that's why we are expecting the results be, to be much closer if we are making this average than any original individual measurement. Okay, that was, that, that was it. Uh, uh, I actually put uh, some comments on the website unizor.com for this lecture and I would suggest you to read these comments um, again. These are like notes for every lecture. It serves like a textbook basically. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.